Over the past five years, 3.8 million American homes have cut the cord, canceling or refusing cable. Younger viewers, so-called millennials, form a growing class of cord nevers. Rejecting the cost of a monthly cable bill, they've turned instead to broadband, high-speed internet connections, and a range of streaming video services to watch what they want, where they want, when they want. We didn't go, 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 go! Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cord Killers, our mission to report the intel from the front lines of the cord cutting revolution so you can watch the stuff you love when you want, where you want, on whatever damn device you choose. That's that it. sounds familiar suddenly, Brian. That, I don't know. I, I don't want to say that we started an avalanche all those years ago when we started using that phrasing, but uh, doggone it, if we didn't say it first, and next thing you know, you know, we have Dana Brunetti on, on frame rate, and then, of course, he whispers in the ear of, of, of um, President Probably. Underwood. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then all of a sudden, everyone's stealing our bit. But I want to give a special thanks to Snakey Dave to uh, who sent in that video. Apparently, that comment, that little report was on the PBS News Hour last night, and so uh, he threw in the go go go, which uh, we yeah, appreciated it was perfect. immensely. I, I was watching. I'm like, oh, that's pretty interesting. And then when he yells go go go, I'm like, oh, that's that's amazing. Yeah, well <laughs> no, it was so, great. It was great. Thanks for doing that, man. Hey, how you doing, Tom? I'm doing well, Brian. I am in San Francisco because we had our Buzz Out Loud 10-year reunion yesterday, which was awesome. And Veronica oh. Belmont very nicely is letting me crash in her studio. Uh, so let's get on to the primary target, shall we? If you insist, sir. I do, sir. Vessel launched to the public March 24th. Uh, and if you got in the first three days, you were able to get a year subscription free. They added a bunch of creators too, a total of 135 of them, including one Brian Brushwood, I hear. Uh, they had 30 before that big wide opening thing you can still get 30 days free if you missed out on the 12 month free deal and then after your 30 days it becomes two dollars and 99 cents a month for the basic package vessel creators uh get paid more too uh cpms that TechCrunch says range around fifty dollars through the service versus an average of two dollars and twenty cents per thousand viewers on youtube but there's also apparently a bounty of around seven dollars for converted subscribers brian i know it's a little weird to be talking about this as a cord killer analyst but also as a participant in the launch uh, what, what, where's your head at? With well, uh, first of all, I, I don't think it's, uh, uh, obviously the news, as you mentioned, but they went from 30, uh, content providers to 70, just like that, you know, and of course, uh, uh full disclosure, uh, I, I don't own scam school that's owned by discovery communications. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but I hit, but I do create and do the entire show. Uh, and so obviously a lot of stuff happened last night or last minute behind the scenes. Um, uh, I, I actually, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. Here's what I do know is that scam school is one of the long titles and I do know that seven dollar bounty um, I, 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 I don't know how any of this is going to work out financially for me but if you do want to try out vessel then maybe go to vessel.com slash scam school because each uh, content creator looks like they have their own portal so instead of there being like a promo code that you use if you go to vessel.com slash scam school uh, put in your email and password and you get your free month and then after that uh, you know I guess I guess there's a bounty here's what's weird to me is is vessel I think is like half right um, they are, uh, here's what I perceive their, their thinking. Uh, YouTube is, a, an abjectly hostile company to content owners and creators. Um, uh, full disclosure, your wife works for YouTube, Yes, but, but it's like, it's like their CPM. We will now war in front of everyone. I, well, well, this is the funny part is we both, this is, uh, uh this entire show is nothing but, uh, um, uh, I don't know, moneyed interests all around <laughs> full disclosures, but get the money out of cord killing. That's what Lawrence Lessig keeps saying. Well, okay. But I, I, I think you and I would both agree that in general, uh, YouTube has a pretty lousy, uh, attitude towards content creators. They, they pay them virtually nothing. Thing. $2, you know, CPM is insane. Uh, they're quick to yank your programming right off the air, whether or not, you know, it, it's yank first, have a discussion about fair use later. Although I would describe it as a cold indifference as, and, and, and not as the husband of someone who works there, but as a creator who puts my stuff up, uh, they don't seem to care. 
Uh, and if they have to take it down for one reason, whatever. Like, they don't care what I think about that. Yeah, uh, and they, 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 it's, they, it's a machine. They do have the attitude of like, well, this is how it's going to be. We And, then, yeah. and keep in mind, that cold indifference goes not only for content creators, it also goes for the community as well. Because when they flip the switch, you're like, hey, by the way, you're all Google Plus now. They sat there stone-faced as, as all of the YouTube community started, you know, raged against the new comment system and then proceeded to use all the benefits of the new commenting system to to rage against it and then at some point they're like well it is kind of cool that we could draw pictures and give but links now you to started URLs. off this conversation you think vessels half right which half do you think they have right and which not they are right if they want to take on YouTube they are right to recognize that there is a market opportunity there they are right to understand that content creators are not getting paid enough uh, they are right to um, to to try to make a, a different better experience uh, and even they may be right for, for having it be a curated experience. Not everyone could get on Vessel is what I assume as far as a content creator. No, right? you have to be accepted by Vessel. It's not an open platform like YouTube. So all of those things I think, I think could be right. Uh, but the part where I wonder if they're right, uh, and I'm, I, I, is, is the assumption that bring the content creators over and their communities will follow. Because when I poked around on Vessel, I, I don't even know how I can, you know, on YouTube, I'm, I respond to every single comment. It's an OCD thing I have. I, I respond. You're like, ha yeah, I did used to have crazy hair. Now I got a TV show. I, I don't know how to do that on Vessel. I don't know how to reply on any of that. Did, did you mess around with it, Bryce? Yeah, because I, I, I posted stuff to Vessel first game school. There's a reply functionality, but it doesn't, like I, I was looking and it's like, it doesn't seem like you can uh, 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 at somebody. Yeah, it looks like your comment is just kind of floating there, and you have to hope. That, so, so if somebody said something four comments ago, you just kind of shout out a response. That's the little bit that I saw. Yeah, that's from what I saw. But here's well, the thing: YouTube is still fantastic if you are nobody and just want to put something up because the, the same machine cold indifference works in your favor there. It's like we also will accept anything from anyone, uh, so you can get up there, and it's fairly good for viewers if you know how to use it, although Vessel is definitely better to navigate, uh, at the same time, you don't have to pay for YouTube to watch it. So well, it's more friendly. I, I feel like it's split for consumers, but that paywall is, I mean, it was really smart to give people a 12 month subscription for free to get people in the gate, get the most ardent fans in the gate. I still wonder, how they're going to be able to convince people to pay $3 a month for this. Well, so here's the thing. If you are looking at it from a content creator's perspective, the list of reasons to go with Vessel are very, very long. It's very easy to rattle off all the benefits, benefits, benefits. The benefits for fans of them, one, 72 hour advanced viewing of content that they're gonna see in 72 hours. And by the way, we're already running into um, interesting issues because, uh, and by the way, you can see into the future. You can see next week's Scam School, you can see next week's Behind the Scam, all that stuff, or uh, next week's uh, Scam School Remix, all of them up there. But all of a sudden we're running into our first like hiccup where it's like, you know, I love to put these little extras on the Scam School channel, like the, uh, uh, like the uh, uh, April Fool's video that we're gonna do this year. Uh, I can't, I, I like that's not that's not scam school that's not on the agreement but if I'm vessel I would imagine that they would want if they could to get that early but but how how would that work you release your sp your special christmas video uh 72 hours before christmas like for all this time stuff, I, I, I or, or your breaking news, you release your breaking news on vessel first Oh yeah, no, I would wait never take days. daily tech news show to vessel uh, because that that sort of thing is is too much to say like oh you have to pay three dollars a month to get the news on time otherwise you get it seventy two hours later no that doesn't work yeah well and I and and it's and it's not just news I I, I don't know and, and again I'm I'm hopeful universally there needs to be more players in this space not fewer you know uh, we need we need people to. Uh, get accustomed to the idea that there should be more than one universal network of web 2.0 net content. And in that regard, I absolutely applaud it. Uh, but I'm, I'm highly curious whether or not uh, this this theory that get the content creators and the, the audience will follow, uh, I, I don't know how to do that without breaking the old system. You know, yeah. uh, without hop, like that's the easiest way is to, to hobble the, the YouTube environment and that content stream to move people over. But I got to admit, uh, these kids, they don't get on Hulu or they don't get on YouTube just to see one person. They get on Hulu or, or on YouTube. I'm sorry. I'm, my head's all over the place. I'm thinking right. of Jason Kilar Hulu. Yeah, right, um, right. The, uh, they get on YouTube 
And if their favorite show isn't there, they will raise their arms and go, wonder where that show went. I'll watch any of the other stuff on YouTube. Like that's, yeah. I, that's, that's what I fear for, for Vessel. I'll put it this way. I wish YouTube were as pretty as Vessel. And they, you know, I, I had some issues with the interface when it first launched in beta and it's, they've actually solved most of them. It's, it's really good to navigate. It's not perfect, but they've, they've improved a lot. Uh, I also think that there is a perfectly natural way to do subscription video. Uh, I wish Vessel had a non-subscription part uh, for, for things that really didn't require subscription because the other part of what they're saying is we can get you a better CPM. It's not all about the subscription video. So, you know, and maybe those are the kinds of things that will grow and evolve. I hope that YouTube, uh, and we know that they've got a YouTube originals thing going on. Uh, we know, of course, I know very well that they have the spaces that they are trying to get for creators in different parts of the world to come in and improve their videos. Hopefully they improve their Thing, and, and it goes right back to what you're saying, Brian. Uh, more people doing this means they drive each other to become better, which is better for all of us. Agreed. Let's uh, thank people who drive us to be better. Our patrons, 2,073 people, Brian, who say, you know what? I like what you do. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and give you a little value for the value that I get out of you. And we can't say thank you enough, folks. You are amazing in supporting this show. Absolutely, man. You guys have made possible our dreams coming true. We don't have to. You know what? Hulu Plus says, hey, man, you have to read an ad about us. And we're like, but we don't like you, Hulu Plus. And you're like, too bad. You got to read it. And we're like, nuh-uh. We're loud, live, and independent. Thank you, patrons. And we're like, hey, Jason Kalar left you and went to Vessel. So yeah. we're going to talk about that today. Although, hey, man, I actually like Hulu Plus, though. What? All right. Yeah. <laughs> controversy. <laughs> ah, controversy about. arises. <laughs> if that's the kind of thing you like, though, I like, I, I set... A parameter. I said, when it gets to this point that it's worth paying for, I will gladly pay for it. I got to that parameter, uh, and now you know, and and now I'm. It's worth it. I still think there's silly things about it. Don't get me wrong. I can't say 100% it's perfect, uh, but it finally got past that point, and I'm, you know, I, and I see now. I think they've they've clarified themselves a little more. They've got to that position. Whatever. But that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use these services. And, and set our own opinions about them and share them with you. And if that is valuable in you, for you in any way and you can afford to give back, Cord Killers Patreon at patreon.com slash Cord Killers. We can't thank you enough. We, we will try, though. Let's move on to Signals Intelligence first, though. So those streaming services, that's what this segment's about, uh, are adding some more channels. The PlayStation View, which remembers only in three cities, uh, New York City, Chicago, and Philadelphia, has added the AMC channels, AMC itself, IFC, Sundance, and WeTV. Uh, that's an addition that is a big advantage on View because you have that cloud DVR. So AMC on Sling TV, you have to wait like a week for episodes of Better Call Saul or The Walking Dead to show up with PlayStation View. You can just set the cloud DVR. VR, I believe. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Meanwhile, Sling TV getting more and more complicated to use. They added A&E and Lifetime, but for the first time, live programs are blocked. Brian, uh, certain episodes like Criminal Minds on A&E, uh, Intervention on Lifetime, or some of the Lifetime made for TV movies, when you try to watch them live, they say, oh, this one, is, this isn't available. You cannot watch this channel live right now. Yeah, this is a, I, I don't know, this is, is it better to lurch forward and have this kind of patchwork of things that work, or is it better to take the Apple perspective of only do it all at once when everything is, is working? I mean, should we be, I, I, I mean, I would say that in general, you know, Sling TV is making bold maneuvers, they're, they're trying to grab deals where they can, but there's so many entrenched interests, this is why... This is why in so many ways, you know, it's easy to get pessimistic about whether or not we'll ever be able to have the full menu of video content available to us. Well, and it, it is it's exactly the right question, because Sling is trying to work within the system. Right. So, in fact, uh, YS. S man in the chat room says they had some difficulties with the Kentucky game on Saturday. I believe those difficulties were because of the streaming service that the, that they use to get the signal because they're not just taking a normal satellite signal in some cases. Uh, and and these deals, the reason they get blocked out is because they they are able to get any to agree at all by saying, well, we'll be a streaming service, but we'll, re we'll respect any conflicts that you have because we'd rather have something than nothing. But it's so confusing for people. It's starting to get hard to say, oh, yeah, just get Sling TV because it's easy to use. It's 
people wonder, they think it's broken. They're like, why is this not working? I want to watch this show right now. Yeah, that's the tough thing is because what Sling TV, their play was uh, for all of you on the fence about cutting the cord, we are finally the solution. And yes, you know, they, they, they're able to make that bold claim. And yes, it gets a little sketchy in the back nine when it starts to say, well, this you can DVR, this you can't DVR, blah, 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 blah. But... At the end of the day, you're able to say complete coverage, all these channels. And this is this is a major crack in that facade that they're putting up in front. I'll tell you one of the other things that I loved about Sling TV at the beginning was the limited number of channels meant it was really easy to pick something to watch. And I have been saying from the beginning that Sling TV is really not for the on-demand viewer. It is for the viewer who wants to put something on, whether it's sports or home programming or food programming. And so the limited number of channels meant, oh, okay, I'll watch the cooking channel, which I might not normally watch, but I'm really interested in, in cooking. So I want to watch a food truck show or whatever, right? Now they've actually added so many channels that it starts to feel like cable where I'm, I'm going through that long scrolling ribbon at the bottom uh, wishing that I had a better way to navigate stuff. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, 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 I have no excuse to really chime in beyond this because I want to get my hands on Sling TV, but instead I invested my time in one of our stories for uh, uh, during the, uh, the front lines. Um, oh, yeah, no, let's, uh, let, let, let's, let's leave Sling TV where it is. it is. I will say it's still great if the one thing you're missing in your cord cutting profile is I just want to be able to put on live TV sometimes and you can't really do that other than over the air if you're a cord cutter. It's great for that. Just pay the $20 and go for that. It's good for 24-hour uh, news channels. If you pay the little extra $5, you get a wealth of 24-hour news channels from around the world that you can't get in a lot of cable services. Uh, but it's still not perfect for everyone. And it's, and it's really complex to explain if somebody's like, well, can I do exactly this? You, you kind of have to look it up. All right, let's gear up, shall we? Because we're going to go to a hotel. Yeah, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, wait. Okay. I thought you we were lot, making Brian. an advance. I was a little bit confused there for a moment. You know, <laughs> when, when you travel and you go to a hotel. So you're saying we're going to go to a hotel and you're going to whip out your stick. Is that what's going on? That's exactly what I'm saying, Brian. A Fire TV stick from Amazon because <laughs> they've updated the Fire TV stick and the box uh, with new firmware. The things that got added to both the stick and the box are... Uh, the ability to hide access pin from kids, the ability to employ shortcuts to sleep and mirroring, easily access it curated prime music playlists, but also the ability to access Wi-Fi authentication systems. So if you've ever gone to a hotel and you log on the Wi-Fi, it says you're connected, but then you have to go to your browser and type in your room number or some password or buy access. You can now do that on the Fire TV, both the stick and the box, support the ability to pop up that screen, even though they don't have a browser per se, and allow you to authenticate yourself, uh, making it a lot easier. You could still work around that in lots of ways, but you had to want to do it. Now anybody can just plug in their Fire TV and log in. A uh, couple things that are only coming to the Fire TV box, USB port enabled now, so you can add storage with some USB drives and support for Bluetooth headphones. So you can listen to the audio of your Fire TV without sending it to the TV if you don't want to bother the kids or the wife or somebody else or husband who's in the room. So I think the most exciting one of those is the hotel thing, but maybe that's because I travel more than well, most. Well, here's the trick. I think uh, the whole marketing it or selling it or even talking about it as a hotel thing, I think is a, is, is a bad idea, or I think it underserves the benefit of this because uh, this is a step in the right direction, but most people are thinking, number one, I don't take my fire stick with me in the hotels, and then you get to the hotel, you don't know if it'll plug in or whatever. Number two, even when I do get online, it's never even fast enough to stream Netflix. Nobody, No hotel has fast Wi-Fi. Here's how it does matter matter a lot colleges universities all these students move in and they've got wi-fi throughout the dorm the cord won't reach or whatever they they don't have a router in their room but there's there's you know, wi-fi all over campus they have the same kind of authentication windows and for those it would be ideal absolutely correct yeah, and conventions. Uh, I don't know that you'd be using your Fire TV at a convention, actually, but you could. Maybe you want to hook it up in your booth if you're a conventioneer or something like that. Uh, that's that's possible. Maybe maybe, I, uh, maybe when you're on your Southwest Airlines flight, you happen to have your your 30 inch television <laughs> with the HDMI. Just gotta plug that in there and see if you can get yes, on. Yes, I totally want to see a picture of someone doing that. Please send it to cordkillers at gmail.com. <laughs> 
Uh, and I'm also curious if there are people who take Chromecasts or Fire TV sticks with them to hotels and what your experience has been. So send that to us as well. Actually, so I would be very interested because I remember there was a brief time that uh, Chad Johnson used to want to see if there was enough room in the, uh, the the gearboxes for him to bring like his Xbox with him so he could set it up inside hotel rooms when we were there. And yeah. uh, I think he very quickly realized that uh, when you travel for 14 hours straight, then do a live show and then get back to the hotel. There are other things you want to do than install a game system on a hotel computer. So send, send us your thoughts, corekillers at gmail.com, and we are going to move along here. Uh, real briefly, let me remind people that there is a store that can support Brian, and there's a store that supports me. Uh, now, Scam Stuff, you hear us talk about for Brian. If you're like, which is the store for Tom? Uh, swordandlaser.com slash store. In fact, that store, in part, pays for this wall behind me at Veronica Belmont's house. What? Yeah. Hold on. Uh, I'm looking at here. Because she's and, my co-host. On uh, swordandlaser.bigcartel.com. Is that where it forwards to? It's swordandlaser.com slash store. It'll, it'll forward to our Big Cartel uh, store. And we just added a sword and laser pint glass in there. So if you're into science fiction and fantasy, you got to check out the show, of course. Uh, and the best way to enjoy the show is to put your favorite beverage in a sword and laser pint glass while you have the sword and laser anthology next to you and you're filling up your sword and laser flask. Dude, that flask is so dope. I love it. I know. The flask is really cool. Anyway, uh, just one of the many projects we have out there to let you folks know about. Let's move on to the front lines. Front lines. Front lines. I'm going to start us off, man, because I know you've been uh, playing around with this. Fan TV has a major update to their app. They rebuilt it from the ground up. Let, the Fan TV app lets you search and now save TV shows and movies and get alerts when they have new episodes. Uh, and you can customize which services you want it to use. So your preferred services are all available in there. Uh, they track 44 services. They do it really nicely, too. There's Hulu and Hulu Plus, Amazon Prime and Amazon Prime Video, Netflix DVD and Netflix. They really break it out well. Uh, mobile web version is coming for non-iOS users. Brian, is this the app we've been looking for? Uh, it totally is, man. I'm going to take a preemptive extension here because I plugged it in. I was a little bit skeptical. And um, what I love about it, first of all, uh, Fan TV started off as Fan Hatton generations ago, correct? I think that is correct. Yeah, and so and so when you, when you load it up there, it basically you got uh, categories new to rent, now streaming, new to own, in theaters now, watch trailers, opening this week, free movies, Oscar winners, spring movies, right? So you got different categories and uh, you're like, oh, Oscar winners. I want to know if, or, like what I did was I did now streaming and it was great because now streaming means if you're somebody who subscribes to a bunch of different services like I do, that odds are all of these are free, ready for you to watch right this very minute. So um, uh, when we do, for example, The Wolf of Wall Street here, in the lower right-hand corner, it says Amazon.com Prime plus five. And what it means by that is you click on it, and it says it's streaming for free on Amazon and Netflix. And then down below that, it has all the, the, the remaining additional options that you have, whether it's to buy it on iTunes, uh, to buy it through Amazon Video, Vudu, or, or, uh, or Disc by Mail on Netflix. It is gorgeous and simple and easy. And uh, this is in every way the I want to be dumb, just make it easy for me to see and experience this stuff that I've been looking for. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, when, oh, and when you click on it, it opens up the app in your phone. So it feels like you're in the environment. Like you, I clicked on it. It's on HBO. So I clicked and it went straight to the HBO Go and opened it. I I agree. It's beautiful. Uh, it, it really is. And 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 uh, they, they've done so many things. The other thing is, even when you turn off the services, uh, it'll still say more available to kind of help if you're like, oh, it's not available in any of the things I subscribe to. Oh, but I see it is available at this other service that I don't subscribe to, which might be a reason to finally set up that service, possibly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hey, man, Movie App Epics is now available on Xbox One. It was already out on the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, PS4, Roku, Android, and iOS devices, and available through Sling. Do you care that it's finally on Xbox One, Tom? No, I mean, partly because it was already there on Sling if I really wanted it on Xbox. Uh, uh, partly because, I don't know, I just don't, I'm, I haven't even paid for it as an addition to Sling TV. Uh, it's great to have choices. Let's yes, be and, and again, we, we, we applaud all that. However, you know, it's funny how quickly I thought about the tribalism that we have. Like, Epics, by and large, tends to serve the same type of stuff that I would have on Netflix. Or if I have Netflix and Amazon Prime, I probably have most of the Ep Epics ecosystem covered. Is that right? 
yeah. I well, yeah. Does Epic still have their deal with Netflix? Because if so, yeah, you you pretty much do. Yeah. Well, uh, in that case, uh, I, I it, it's tempting to go like, why why should I care? But I, I, again, more players, better for us. We want choice, choice, choice. Boom. Google is developing a TV show with mummy producer Scott Daniel Company based on the game Ingress, uh, which involves visiting real world landmarks and capturing them via commands on a smartphone app. Uh, Is there a reason they shouldn't do this? I mean, why not try making a TV show out of an app? Well, uh, number one, Ingress. Have you ever played around with Ingress? Have you played it? No, I haven't. Uh, it is amazing. It's 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 a cool thing, and if I was was still traveling as much as I used to, I could see really getting into it. And and you've got these two different identities for these warring factions. It's a good setup, and they have an engaged audience. People are so into Ingress. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, official or not, but they have like news reports from the future where they talk about like terrorists insurgents or you know these guys have taken down this stuff. If you search uh, uh, on YouTube, you'll find them. Um, I, there is, I'll do an extension here. There, there is a way it could go wrong. And that is right now it's a blank slate. You got two loosely defined factions and you pick one or the other based on, you know, roughly what you're into and, uh, and whether or not, which one's dominant in your town. And you're able to sort of project your own values onto them. The only way this could screw up is if, you know, they try, if, if they cover it both sides and all of a sudden, like once you have an actual face and an actual actor associated with your side, then it's like, yeah, you guys got the cool actor and we got the dumb actor well, and I d- hate it our story. It might not be actors. Maybe they're just going to do a reality show with, you know, carefully selected but regular people Dude, that would playing be great. the game. Uh, yeah, or, or, or even, you know, telling real life stories of, about it or uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I think there's a lot of things that they could go right. Very few ways this could go wrong. All right. Uh, quick check. I uh, found a Variety article from February that says that Amazon and Epix extended their movie licensing pact. Uh, it's a multi-year pact and that Netflix still has there. So you're you're right. You can get those both. It's like a 90-day delay. So the advantage of getting the Epix service is you get it before it shows up on Netflix and Amazon. Got it. Your story next, oh, brother. Doggone it. it. I'm sorry. I was screwing that up. TechCrunch spotted a playlist, six YouTube videos that are both 60 frames per second and available in 4K. Does this silky smooth high resolution playback excite you yet, Tom? Yes. Dude, in take concept. A, take a look uh, at it. I don't have the right equipment to today to look at these. Well, uh, I mean. But someday I will. And then I will be very excited to watch these uh, pop singers from asia sing in high definition <laughs> uh yeah no i think they look really good of course playing them all at once is going to make it difficult to uh well yeah and these... you really can't tell <laughs> yeah. i mean they're gonna they're gonna look good on your laptop Dude. but don't change the resolution right because what happens if you change it to 60 frame per second in 4k then it's going to look bad well no no no, no. I, 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 if i understood it correctly uh 60 60 frames per second you're seeing regardless you're seeing on on, on any resolution uh, that's a good point it's yeah, just actually, also yeah. 60 frames per second at 4k is now available so yeah, yeah. i mean looking at it in 1080p 60 frames look really good to me yeah sorry, comcast attorney ahead. francis buono wrote to the fcc and i quote not only has NBC Universal not withheld programming from Apple's new venture, Apple has not even approached NBC Universal with such a request. Uh, Brian, I have my own ideas, but why do you think that would be? I am so glad that you have ideas because I read this. I read the entire article and I'm like, I still don't really know what the dispute is. And this sounds technical, but based on what you're saying, it sounds like somebody's got their own gig they're working on the side. Well, the rumor has been that Apple's creating their own service and it won't involve NBC because Comcast and and, and Apple were trying for a long time to do a service on Comcast and it didn't work out. My guess is Apple just stopped talking to NBC Universal because they're not ready to launch it yet and they know because of the regulation put on Comcast when they acquired NBC that NBC has to give the Apple service its service at similar terms to other services that are equivalent. Uh, so Apple's like, let's just negotiate the best deals we can with the people who have to negotiate and then go to NBC. Uh, hey man, Hulu Japan now has more than 1 million subscribers who have collectively viewed more than 360 million hours of video since the service first launched in 2011. Should we move to Japan? The answer is yes, but not for the reason you think. Yes, exactly. Uh, this this is interesting that that Hulu's very popular there, and 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 I kind of that's why I threw it in there. It was a person on Twitter, uh, in fact, John Anilio, uh pointed out 
this. And, I, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that is interesting that Hulu is like skyrocketing uh, in Japan. But it's Hulu Japan. It's got different licensing deals. It's got a different audience. Uh, so it's something of note. Well, I but, you it. know, and also it's like on the one hand, you're right. There's regional differences. You know, was it Orkut that's still popular in Brazil or whatever? Well, not anymore. They finally shut it down. But for but, a long time. Yeah, right. You absolutely. get these pockets. But also keep in mind, you know, by the numbers. I mean, not, you know, the numbers are obviously very different. But, you know, one million in Japan, I think we're up past uh, five million in the United States. Right. Is that correct? That last time I checked, that's what I found when I poked. Online. I don't know. I got you. Got a search engine. <laughs> I just didn't know. It, it's uh, just knowing you, you'd be all like, "Well, those were last uh, year's figures." Hulu Brian. now with six million subscribers. Told you. Told you. Crunch. Always yeah. ask Tom. Yeah, I'm fast on the Googles. <laughs> time for under surveillance. Not like you just tell you it's all about location. This is the segment about things you can watch, and one of the things you'll soon be able to watch is new X-Files episodes with David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson as Mulder and Scully. They will return for a six-episode story arc on Fox. Production with Chris Carter at the helm will begin this summer. No air date has been announced yet. Now, Chris Carter, uh, do you think this has anything to do with the uh, with the... Uh, the the lack of fire created with Chris Carter's uh, w was it the others or, or uh, let's put it this way, Brian. It certainly made him available since he didn't have a series <laughs> on Amazon he had to produce. Exactly. Uh, I, it'll be interesting to see. I think this will have a very passionate fan base, but it's curious to me that it's coming back to Fox proper, not in so you know like Twin Peaks is coming to Showtime, right? right. You know what yeah, was. Yeah. A while ago, a, a, a very niche, very popular um, among a certain group uh, broadcast show is showing up on a cable network. I, I It'll be interesting to see if it has the juice. Of course, you could say it's coming down from the cinema because they had two X-Files movies. They yeah, that one just well, a few years ago. I think that's ago. the thing. X-Files was massively popular on broadcast television for almost a decade or about a decade, I think, and then went to movies. Twin Peaks also had a movie. So it's coming down from a movie, but it had many fewer seasons. It did not have the rating success that X-Files did. So, yeah, I guess it makes sense that they're coming to broadcast when you think about it. Uh, yeah. I, I, OK. I mean, especially I, I would just be surprised if the numbers were anything near what they used to have in their hate. Probably not. Yeah. You're, you may be right about that. Uh, just broadcast numbers in general aren't right. Yeah. Well, and, that, Steve, and that's the biggest reason is we've had this massive diaspora over the last 30 years. Steven Spielberg has signed on to direct the movie adaptation of Ernie Klein's Ready Player One. Woo! Uh, if you didn't know this already, Zach Penn, who wrote X-Men 2 and Incredible Hulk, has written the most recent draft for Warner Brothers. Does this get you excited or worried that Spielberg's on board? No, no. Uh, very excited. Just because, okay, uh, I, I, mean, I mean, Steven Spielberg, outside of AI, can you name a single genuinely terrible Steven Spielberg movie in the last... 20 years schindler's list was okay all right about a terrible topic but it was a really good movie <laughs> like this is sort of a a baseline and, and by the way strike it rich is trying to zing me with 1941 i said in the last 20 years uh, ah. uh no i thought war of the worlds was good i'm gonna argue with the chat that's the new show now <laughs> okay yeah, uh, just watch Brian uh, it, it, it at least points to a baseline of quality that we're going to be seeing. And uh, and uh, I, I'm supposed to have lunch with Ernie in the next uh, uh, week or two. And I can't wait to pick his brain. I mean, he oh, has to be uh, just Brian, geeking out. Brian. I, I, yeah, no, I dropped that name. That yeah, happened. The, you might want to pick that up. <laughs> okay. Hey, the Walking Dead spinoff that will be set in Los Angeles has a name. It's going to be called Fear the Walking Dead. And a trailer premiered during the Walking Dead season finale last night. Uh, very short trailer. It's like 60 seconds or less long but it, the this gives you the the setting which is that you're going to be in Los Angeles before anything has happened like right at the beginning yeah um i i i understand when you have a name that's pure solid money making gold you want to wedge it into the title but just adding the word fear in front of the title for the other one i mean i i have a gut feeling because I, uh, that's my gut reaction, actually, is the same thing. Like, really? That's all they did? They put Fear the Walking Dead? That <laughs> sounds weird. But, but I have a gut feeling, after the gut reaction, that it will make more sense once we start watching it. Because I'm, I think what they're trying to say is, this isn't The Walking Dead. This is building up the fear of The Walking Dead before we ever even see them. Yeah. yeah. Well, if it's the early days of contagion, if we're going to see like, you know, quarantine stories and, you know, when when, oh, society will probably live on and then it doesn't. I could see that, you know, where it's like yeah. and, and especially what's going to be weird. Oh, you know what? I guess uh, I was thinking, uh, like, how is it going to be 
that, you know, if it's in the past, how are they going to have the whole like everyone's got the virus and you die and you automatically reanimate? But then I realized that it's on the different coast. So maybe on the West Coast, uh, they, they do figure it out earlier. Well, yeah, the trailer basically says, hey, there's a new flu going around. So uh, if you're feeling bad, why don't you you should head home and take care of yourself uh, because you're going to die and come back as a zombie is the part they don't say. <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right, what have you been watching, Brian Brushwood? Because I didn't watch as much. In fact, I've, I'm just going to tell the spoiler in time fans right now. I failed on The Shield. I did not watch an episode of The Shield this week. Dude, but I'm glad what you did instead. Uh, first of all, I as long as we're saying that we failed... I told people I was going to snap back, get all the way caught up in The Walking Dead in time for the finale. Yeah, maybe sort of watch Going Clear last night instead of the finale because I hadn't seen all the other stuff. And then today I spent uh, three hours getting caught up on episodes 13, 14, and 15 and I uh, have not watched the finale. So we'll do everything else. <laughs> so you got uh, right up to the finale. We can talk about the finale next week. Yes. Okay, yes. Good. Although people are going to be howling right now. They're like, ah, I wanted to hear about it. So we'll talk about that. Uh, also, I watched uh, uh, Kimmy Schmidt up through episode nine or maybe even 10. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of thoughts on that that we'll talk about in spoiler in time. Of course, Better Call Saul. And I watched the uh, new Max Landis storytelling joint. You remember Max Landis did um, the, the death and rebirth of Superman, where he spent like a half hour, you know, making a hilarious uh, summary of that whole arc. And uh, this time he does it uh, over uh, a story of wrestling. He tells the story of Triple H in the uh, WWE and, uh, and found that amusing. Uh, fantastic. I, I, I watched Better Call Saul as well. Uh, the Walking Dead finale. Uh, I, I'm watching Flash and the Arrow. Uh, Flash, I think, had the better week than Arrow because of the where Arrow is in its story is just a little harder to... to you, you know where they're going, but you kind of have to do some business. It's that kind of a story right now. But I'm really liking them both. Uh, also caught up on Once Upon a Time, which I think is much better than it was uh, the, the first half of the season. And I still liked the first half of the season, but I, fe I feel like they've got the magic back, Brian. What magic? Because there's magic in the world. Anyway. Um, <laughs> also, last night, I was about to watch The Shield uh, when I sat down and Brian texted me that he was what or I, I'd been texted by Brian that he was watching Going Clear. So I thought, well, let me just let me just punch this up and see what it looks like. I, I watched the first couple of minutes. I got sucked in. Now, here's here's the hilarious part. When I came upstairs to watch The Shield, uh, Veronica and her husband were going to watch last week's Better Call Saul, which I'd already seen. So I'm like, oh, OK, you, you guys have fun. I'm going to go upstairs and watch The Shield. So I start watching Going Clear. At one point, I pause it for some reason and I can hear the TV downstairs. They're watching Going Clear. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, and so, so, so what, what caused them to defect? I guess they saw the Twitter buzz and were they, like, let's yeah, check same, it out. Same sort of thing. They heard people talking about it and thought, well, let's, let's, let's check this out, see what it's like. Yeah, we'll go into more detail, but I think it's safe to say it. Like, I, I thought it was chilling and wonderful. And, I, and this is somebody who's read, uh, you know, I read uh, Inside Scientology. I've been following this this insane story, you know, Operation Clambake back in the late 90s. I would go to that website all the time. Um, it is uh, a mysterious story. And uh, we'll talk about the nature of the storytelling that they do um, uh, later on. I can't believe you watched Kimmy Schmidt, though, man. It's so bad. Uh, all right. Is it time to take some dispatches from the front, Let's sir? Let's take some dispatches from the front. <laughs> Bob wrote in and said, hey, guys, as someone who runs a website that produces a lot of local shows, uh, I think Meerkat and Periscope are game changers. Uh, Meerkat and Periscope, if you're not aware, are apps that let you live stream from your phone. He says, we now have the ability to do interviews, cover concerts, other live events with a mere cell phone. Who needs a TriCaster satellite hookup and other expensive equipment? And don't forget what that means for events like the Ferguson riots and Arab Spring. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the legal issues surrounding this technology. It's fine if my friend lets me live stream his band's concert at a bar downtown, but what if I go to a Metallica concert or a pro wrestling event? There was a lot of talk last year about people's rights to record the police during an arrest and the cops' rights to seize and access the phone to get the video off of it. All that's a moot point if the video is streamed live on Twitter. To your knowledge, how do the laws stand now and where do you think they will go in the future? Thanks, Bob. So if I understand correctly, let's start with 
probably the most experienced uh, version would be um, uh, like a, a sporting event, NFL. Like it's it's built into your ticket when you go to the live event that you will not retransmit any of this stuff, right? Otherwise, they can kick you out. Um, uh, I may be wrong about that. Uh, no, that's, uh, that's often the case, most often the case. Copyrighted music, technically, you're not allowed to retransmit even a live thing unless you get a, uh, a live whatever permission. But here's the thing is legally, yeah, all the rights are on the, the content creator side. I mean, but, but then you get to weird stuff like wrestling, right? Let's uh, like WrestleMania probably had, I, I was talking with Justin Robert Young about this. Um, there were so many people who had the ability to meerkat and to, uh, and, and to Periscope. And when you think about what we did at our Diamond Club event, uh, where we did uh, South by So Wasted, and essentially so many people were streaming that somebody was able to throw up a live switching thing and just, just go different angles, show, show different uh, audio feeds at the same time. That ability is just going to be more and more stuff to where you can now do uh, essentially a version of uh, the Beastie Boys did a movie called Dude I F and Shot That, where they bought like 80 video cameras, handed it out to random people in the audience. They all got their own story. They all got different angles. And then they cut it together. They took all the tapes. Uh, and then strangely, they, they returned all the, the uh, cameras to the store and then they cut a, a, a movie, a concert movie, and the, uh, the fans did it. I think you're going to start to see more and more of that happening on the positive side. On the legal side, I think they'll always have the right to say, we do not give permission. You cannot do this. This is illegal. I think they'll also understand that none of the momentum is on their side to try to keep this genie in a bottle. And instead, you're going to see more and more people trying to take advantage of these capabilities. I'll refer you to an episode of Buzz Out Loud from 2009 for my answer. I don't know which one. But essentially, this this is just not something that no one has had to deal with, except on the scale. That's the only thing I'll say. Uh, I, in fact, we'll throw an article in the show notes. Uh, in fact, Joe, very nicely, who does our show notes, will throw this article in from the Blog Herald in 2009 about Justin.tv and about Quick. And the idea that, oh, we can now stream live from things. What will that mean? And, and Brian covered it very well. If you're going into a private venue that includes stadiums often, that definitely includes a lot of concert halls and bars, you're going to have to deal with copyright and permissions and all of that. And that's not new. You had to deal with that with, with cameras before anyway. You had to deal with that with still photographs for a long time. Uh, so those same policies are going to be in place. And, and what Brian's talking about is not the law, but the strategy, right? That's where that is. The law is the law. And I don't think that's really even going to change. However, out in public, uh, the law is different. You have an expectation of privacy in your own private venue. Uh, you don't have an expectation of privacy in public. And so there's lots of laws about the fact that you are free as a journalist to shoot video if you're on public land and in a public place. And that should apply to people with Meerkat and Periscope going on as well. Uh, and yes, as we already saw in Ferguson, uh, we're going to have people resist that right and say, oh, no, but there's a line here and you can't cross it there. And so I think where Bob does ask a very relevant question is in politically charged situations now that so many people have live streaming capability than have had it before. Uh, will there be changes in law for those specific types of events? That'll be interesting. Well, and I think it'll be a clarification of what the uh, sort of the law of the land or, or, or the presumptive uh, capability to, uh, especially in public, like on the street, you know, uh, street's a public place, but there's a difference between filming a riot or a police uh, attack or something on the street versus walking up, recording some random street performers stuff, live streaming it, and then all of a sudden selling a DVD DVD of this public event that you witnessed on well, the street. You just did two, and I, again, not a lawyer, but you did two different things. It is fine for me to walk up to a performer on the street and stream him. And maybe that, maybe there'll be somebody pushed for a change of that law. But right now, that is, you're like, look, street performer, you're in public. So that, you don't have an expectation that that won't happen right now. Right. Uh, at the same time, taking that stream later like on Periscope, and right. monetizing it or selling it, suddenly there's a performance right involved that is not the same as the live streaming right, and that you don't necessarily have. I'll tell you what, man, it's going to be a, a tricky, sticky, interesting situation. And I, I suspect that, uh, that that technology outpaces legislation is something that uh, Andrew Maine told me a long time ago. And, I, and, and normally I get all bent out of shape about the laws and how they need to change. But these a lot of these laws that you're worried about are probably going to be irrelevant in the next three to five years. 
Got an email from Turkey. Uh, I want to read this one. I know, I know you read. The, I read the last one too, but I'm going to be selfish because Turkey please. Uh, is one of my favorite guys on the internet. Uh, he is a regular on the Phileas Club. Uh, with Patrick Beja, and I'm just happy that he wrote in. He said, thanks for the great show. I thought I'll let you know about my cord-cutting experience here in Saudi Arabia. Just to clarify something, in Saudi, we didn't have a cable until about three years ago with two fiber providers started providing such a service. We rely on satellite TV. There are almost 300-plus free channels and a couple of paid networks. I was able to stop using all of them. I currently have only Internet and Netflix. For Netflix, I'm using a service called Unotelli that acts as a proxy to mask my connection as if I were in the United States or any other Netflix country. I also occasionally use iTunes and YouTube. My main box is an Apple TV after my Western Digital Live device broke down. I just bought a Roku 3 and got Amazon Prime, so we'll see how that works out. Being in a country where torrenting is common and no one really cares, I do use it a lot, mainly for CBS, HBO stuff, and movies. I'm trying to be all legal, but it's difficult here, as there are hardly any legal services in Saudi at the moment. I'm looking into seeing if I can get Sling TV or might just wait for the rumored Apple service. Hope this gives you an idea of how things are in Saudi Arabia. Keep up the good work. Thanks, so Turkey. Here's what's fascinating to me is that it, it this is the same discussion that we've had o over the years. And we've sort of set our line where it's like, look, we're not going to encourage any people to pirate. We're going to focus on all the free uh, or the, the legal alternatives, the way you can buy stuff. Um, but it occurs to me that in that boundary between legal and ethical, that line looks different in the United States than it does in Singapore, right? I mean, how would you, if somebody, if this person was in Singa Singapore, it'd be like, well, yeah, you live in the land of everything's pirated and, you know, I, I can't blame you. If, you. if you walk out and everyone's trying to set you, you probably couldn't buy a legitimate copy of a thing, even if you wanted to. If that was your stated goal, you're, you probably would, would get tricked and fooled along the way. But oh, like, I love this gray area of Saudi Arabia because you think of it as a more metropolitan um, uh, or, or more, I guess, more Western uh, uh, place. And yet and yet clearly he's having a hard time figuring out a way to do everything legally. Yeah. And, and we're not in condoning doing things illegally. And we're not even saying that, you know, and therefore, you know, Saudi Arabia is a scoff law country or anything like that. <laughs> Whoa, you definitely said those words just now. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not saying that. What we're saying is. Uh, in some countries, you don't have the option. Uh, and just like the United States, for a long time, people didn't have the option. Now we have more options, and the piracy starts to be a different kind of issue, less of an issue in some cases. Uh, and that's what Turkey says. He's like, I try to do it as legal as possible. So, you know, this, but, but, but I appreciate that he is giving us uh, the true perspective of like, here's what I need to do to be able to cobble together my internet TV viewing. And by the way, when I say a scofflaw country, the number one scofflaw country is often Canada or Australia as far as the piracy reports go. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Uh, cool. Hey, man, we got an email. Uh, I was going to try to figure out who it's from, but then I saw the end. It's message. Longtime viewer, second time writer. My number came up and I am currently a Nielsen panel member in Chicago. It infuriates me to no end that nothing I watch via my Apple TVs gets Nielsen credit. Not sure what to do with my anger except channel it your way and hope something will change Nielsen corporate practices. As I'm sure you could guess, I'm not meant to reveal my status, so please don't mention my name. Uh, hey, man, I say do what I do which was a uh, lie and write down whatever shows you think deserve to stay on the air. Depends on if he's doing a book though. He may not be, he may be doing the Nielsen machine in which case he can't lie. It's just in that case, oh, the only thing what? you can do is not check in, but they, they can tell if, you know, uh, the pattern here's what you weird. do. You, you yeah. on purpose, find the worst programming. You go find some cable access and watch the hell out of that. And then some cable access is going to be like last night, our numbers went up <laughs> 8,000%. And you're going to make the name. Growing chicks with Scott was the number one show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, I, absolutely. And, but a, a, a thing to point out here is that Nielsen does rate Apple TV things separately. They have started some approaches to that. So even though they're not rating it for you, which is annoying, if they should just like whatever you're watching, we should rate it. They they are trying to unify those things. So maybe eventually they'll get there. Uh, 
there's controversy about Tom. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but last week in Spoiler in Time, I mentioned that, uh, maybe on the program proper, I mentioned that uh, uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt was was not kindling with me. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't set in fire. It felt, felt overly written. It felt like the comedy was overly... Um, uh, f- I don't want to say formulaic. It was just overwritten. Everything was so process heavy. And it's like, this has to be the running gag and all this stuff. I had some problems and uh, some people didn't like me uh, calling their girlfriend uh, ugly. And uh, and then they, they wrote letters like... Well, here's the thing, Brian. You never called that girlfriend ugly. What you said is... I wouldn't date her. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, okay. For example, uh, Matt Which writes this. Which can be thought to be insulting. <laughs> well, if we, I, I do want to deconstruct this because, yeah, yeah. first of all, let me be very clear. I apparently said something, and maybe somebody can explain it to me in another way. I apparently said something that got people thinking that my attitude was something different from what it is. But, uh, for example, this email from Matt says, Hi, Brian and Tom. In general, I agree with Tom's assessment that Kimmy Schmidt is two things at once, a great show and something Brian just isn't into. Brian? I'm not going to tell you that you should like something you don't, but please don't say it's a bad show just because you don't like it. I'm pretty sure I didn't. There are many shows on TV that I could tell are good, but I just don't like them. What I do take issue with is that you're mad at a show for not for doing what it's trying to do. I, I don't think I said I'm mad at the show. And telling it it should do something else. I don't think I said I should do something else. Okay, but we, I don't even think we need to read this whole okay. email because that's the gist of it right there. And here's yeah. the thing, folks. I am have not gone back and listened either, but I'm pretty sure that I don't remember Brian saying it was bad or that he was mad at it. What I do remember is that Brian got very excited about talking about the things that he was critical of and the things that he honestly didn't like about the show. And I think some people interpreted that when he was saying, you know, I don't like it that they do this. I don't like it that they do that, that he was saying, I don't like the show or even worse, because that's fine to say I don't like the show, that he hated the show. Uh, yeah, well, especially because that's factually in error because I went on to watch six more episodes and it's my favorite thing to watch with Bonnie right now. Uh, however, I will say it's very hit and miss. We'll, we'll talk about it in spoiler in time, but uh, but uh, a secret spoiler, um, the characters are the best part. Of, some of the characters are the best part of that show. And then uh, our boss, Ben, uh, put forth the theory that uh, NBC made a big mistake when they didn't pick up Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt because they recently announced they're going to launch a paid subscription internet streaming channel. We talked about that. And he points out all they said they would have are The Tonight Show, Jimmy Fallon, and SNL. Um, maybe they should have more comedies uh, like, I don't know, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt that they could add to such a service. <laughs> well, well put, Ben. Very smart. <laughs> John W. wrote in and said, I think you guys with your fancy Unity remotes are forgetting how great the CEC functionality is on the PS3. This means that you can have one box hooked up to one TV using one remote acting as your game system, television, Netflix, Hulu, Twitch box, music streaming box. This could be the death of the universal remote because no one will ever want anything but a PS3 or a PS4 or an Xbox. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Works for I, all of I, 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 can't, I can't hook in my Fire Stick to it, right? Or my Chrome Stick, right? Well, you don't need those because you've got everything you need on the Xbox One or the PS4. Yeah, or the yeah, PS4. but I like I like talking into the Fire Stick remote and just say, You like, can talk to your Xbox One and your PS4. Okay, all right. All right, all right. Maybe. I'll, or I'll give as it Captain time. Kipper says, unless your TV doesn't support CEC. <laughs> oh, touche. Good point. Uh, Gunner writes in saying, hello, Brian and Tom. I want to send you a message to let you know about something interesting I noticed while listening to your last show. While Tom and Anthony were trying to activate all my toys, I Sorry found myself that. suddenly. Uh, what's that? I said, sorry about that, folks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although you have nothing to apologize for. He says, I found myself suddenly panicking, thinking I was going to need to tell everything to disregard. To my surprise, my Amazon Echo did not activate when Tom kept saying Alexa. Although I'd be interested to hear if it worked for me just now. Alexa. <laughs> uh, I then proceeded to run my own experiment and rewind the podcast a few times to see if it was a fluke. My echo never awoke. I then asked Alexa for, Alexa for the weather and immediately responded. I've tried three more times to get Tom's voice via the podcast to wake up my echo to no avail. My assumption is that echo learning my voice, uh, learns his voice and distinguishes between him, a legit query and some podcast. Uh, there you go. Yeah, no, that's great. More, uh, uh reporting right from the front. Alexa. Add oil to shopping list. <laughs> and that's it for the Cord Killers show. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address is cordkillers at gmail.com. We're live on diamondclub.tv Mondays at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. 
Uh, anything else to tell the fine folks before we leave, Brian? Uh, no, man. Just uh, uh, keep those letters coming in, and please understand that uh, I get excited, and it doesn't mean I'm mad. I just, I just get so pumped. He's just excited. He's mad to tell you about cord killing, and he'll do it again <laughs> next week. Fair enough. Hey, guys. Tom and Brian here. We just wanted to say thank you to all of our $5 patrons who keep us loud, live, and independent. You guys make Court Killers the production that it is. Your name appears in the video credits and appears in our hearts. And if you'd like to become one of them or see who they are, you can go to patreon.com slash court killers. You'll need to do more than just go there, though. You'll have to sign up and, you know, pledge an amount. But Unless you just want to see who they are. Well, I mean, you can gawk. That's a little creepy, isn't it? If you want to be a gawker, let's go. It's up to you. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>